folks, good evening. Um, Vicki, I am the I'm the founder and managing director of P Hope. We just launched last week and everything's been very exciting over the last week or so. Um, and we were coming together tonight to talk about um, access to justice, particularly for people who've got mental health problems or who have a, um, a history of trauma. Um, I'm going to ask the speakers to introduce themselves in a moment, but first I just want to let you know that we're recording the webinar. It only records the speakers. Um, so everyone's muted and you won't be able to unmute yourself during the course of the webinar, but you can please do use the chat and just to prove um, that the chat works. I'm just going to drop in our PayPal donate link. Um, so <laughs> the, the webinars are paid to feel so um, if anyone hasn't had a chance to do that and would like to, that's all that link's there for, no pressure. Um, and please do ask us any questions that you'd like to in the chat and we'll pick them up during the course of our discussions. It's a panel webinar, so we're just going to be talking through some of the key issues around justice, um, mental health and um, the systems and how it impacts on people who've had experiences of trauma. So. David, would you like to introduce yourself for me, please? Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is David Gibson. Uh, I'm a solicitor uh, based in Newcastle, uh, Short Richard and Forth, uh, and I specialise in uh, employment law issues with a particular interest in mental health issues. Um, and uh, I do quite a bit of voluntary work in the mental health sector as well. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, David. And Roz, would you like to introduce yourself for me, please? Thank you. Good evening. I am Rosette Warrior. I am now an advocate public speaker on behalf of victim survivors of child sexual abuse. I'm an ambassador with Survivors Voices, and I am the project manager for LittleRoe.org. Thank you. Thanks, Roz. So, the reason that I wanted to, to host a webinar around justice is because everyone should be entitled to justice. I think I'm quite a believer in the idea that people should be able to access justice, but it's quite what justice means and what it is and what the reality of it is when you get into the system. It can be it can be an injustice um, for a lot of people and it can also be a very difficult system to negotiate and it can reinforce some of the harms that people have experienced in wider society and I think that it's really important that we think about this particularly um, when we're talking about trauma and the experiences that people can have and how how much of an impact that can have on people's lives and how we know that being heard and seen and understood through our experiences is important as part of the healing and then when we go through justice systems that isn't always the experience that people have. So I really wanted to kind of think about some of these issues and to think about how people who are already disadvantaged can be more disadvantaged by a system that's designed to protect people and their human rights. So um, I just wanted to get started by just having a bit of a think about just some basic stuff around definitions in systems, because I think this can sometimes be, be something that that is is difficult to negotiate one of the, I remember when I started doing my peer support training, one of the things that, that I learned from Sherry Mead from Intentional Peer Support was this idea that people can come, come into systems as survivors and come out of systems as victims and mental health patients, and that that can be a real shift in someone's identity. So I just wanted to kind of start by having a conversation, and David, I'm going to come to you first because you are the man of the law, <clears throat> just to tell us a little bit around how the law defines mental health and psychological harm. Indeed. Well, appallingly, to be quite blunt, um, we had the Equality Act 2010, which was supposed to be a sweep all provision to ensure that there was uh, clarity in terms of discrimination law. And um, what we saw in relation to the definition of disability was something that was quite concerning. Number one, there were only two conditions that would automatically qualify as being protected under the Equality Act as a disability. Number one uh, was HIV, excellent. The second one was in relation to MS, excellent. The third one, where people had to have a battle to ensure automatic uh, protection, was in relation to cancer, because the government thought that, that was too broad a term and it took a lot of campaigning to even get that. Now, in relation to mental impairment, 
what the statute definition is, it's long and it's unwieldy. It must have a substantial long-term adverse impact on your ability to perform normal day-to-day -day activities. And at the outset of the legislation, there was a lot of confusion about issues in relation to anxiety and depression, because what the courts were saying, well, one day you could be all right, next month you might not be. Therefore, is it really long term? And it took case law to actually establish that a condition that had peaks and troughs actually could be protected under the legislation. When we first saw the legislation come onto the statute books, tribunals were really struggling with the whole issue of mental health issues and were even turning down cases where somebody was suffering from schizophrenia because there wasn't enough evidence. Now, we then saw over, the, over after about five or six years or so, a bit more of a liberal approach and understanding of mental health issues. But I have noticed uh, in the last two to three years or so, Vicky, that there seems to be a bit of a pushback from tribunals in relation to people trying to establish that they have a mental impairment for the purpose, purpose of the disability. And even after disclosure of quite detailed medical notes and records, and quite how shall I say, open accounts of how depression, anxiety, mental health issues can have an impact, still tribunals are saying, is this enough? And I see this as an incredibly high hurdle at times for people suffering from mental health problems in terms of actually satisfying the statutory definition before they can then even go on and say, oh, I've been treated less favourably on those grounds or there should have been reasonable adjustments. And it really is... I would say quite an impediment to a number of people uh, to, to getting their cases before the employment tribunal needs to be addressed. You know, I think, and I think that's a real, one of the things that is a real issue is, is the understanding in, in um, the legal sector around what mental health is and where it comes from. And also the, the stigma that is experienced by people who have a psychiatric diagnosis, but who might, mm -hmm. who might not consider themselves to be disabled because we, we can up, 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 up at one time be diagnosed with a psychiatric issue, but then also not consider ourselves to be disabled, but still experience discrimination just on account of the diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and I think um, it becomes even more complex. I'm going to bring was bring was in for a second because I think it becomes even more complex when we're talking about trauma and experiences of trauma and being really sorry, my my dog's currently decided that this room is a is like an assault course and she's throwing herself across like the place. So just cool. you see a fly and lurcher, I'm just going to apologise in advance. She's healthy and no dogs have been harmed during the creation of this webinar, I promise. Um, but what I was trying to say was that um, that, that for people who've, who've survived abuse and who are experiencing psychological harm off the back of that, you've then got the added hurdle of you need to get a diagnosis to be able to be considered to be somebody who, who might... Um, be discriminated against under the Equalities Act. Right, and I don't know whether or not that's something that you've come across with people who, who've been who've encountered the system in that way. I think that every system, every institution that we have, has obstacles and hurdles to people who are BIPOC, and by that I mean Black, Indigenous, and people of colour, to people who are not the norm, people who do not fit into mental well-being. Now, I'm not talking about effective middle-class white male alcoholics. They have access to all the systems. There are no obstacles there. Turn up with your grey pinstripe suit and purple tie, sorry, burgundy tie, and you're okay. But it doesn't matter if we're talking about benefits. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the prison system. It doesn't matter if we're talking about hospital admissions. So to sort of contextualise that, a black woman has been sectioned for sitting in front of her parole officer picking rice because it was seen as crazy. Whereas that's what you do when you buy rice that has not been pre-fluffed, pre-packed and pre-Sainsbury's. Whereas if somebody is a functioning alcoholic, they will not have that section put upon them. Access to justice takes money. Money is not spent in large sums on mental health issues. So a very small example of this, and I'm, I'm sure David will agree and can speak to this, is we have review after review after review after all these wonderful things that are going to be done that are never resourced. So what, the latest, because there's always something, is you're going to get pre-trial therapy, except for there's no money in the pot. So the whole thing comes down to if you are from the larger population and you have 
in mental health, there is an issue in terms of your background, BIPOC, where you come from. If you have somebody who is vulnerable in another way, the system isn't there for you because fundamentally, and I'm sorry, Vicky, this is really gonna open up what you've been talking about. Our systems were never designed for the minority. They were created for the <clears throat> minority mm. to protect things, not people. So when we talk about justice, when we talk about whether we're talking about arbitration or we are talking about other neo justice systems, they are not actually for mm. everyday folk. David, I'm gonna pass that on to you to agree, yeah. disagree or No, I think I think it's an excellent point, Ros, and, and what's interesting is I think it is a historic, systemic uh, situation that we face. Um, with doing some homeschooling a few weeks ago, uh, I was looking at with uh, my daughter the 1601 poor laws, and I don't think the attitude towards people who, uh, uh, who are on low incomes, people who have mental health issues, or people who are unemployed, has actually changed that much. Because what we do, we immediately put people into categories, we immediately stigmatise, and we immediately prevent them from being empowered to enforce their rights. And one of the big issues, and I think we, we'll probably sink to the same hymn sheet on this, Ros, it's all right having a right on a piece of paper, but it's a paper tiger. It's a paper tiger. And the reason it's a paper tiger is because the support and funding for that right isn't there. If we look at the convention on, uh, on, on uh, the, the UN Convention on, on the Rights of People with Disabilities, it talks about a fair trial. It talks about the state supporting people so that they can have representation whether it be at their Section 2 renewal or whether it be at an employment tribunal. We don't have that. So that historic culture is enforced by the system through the lack of funding and a lack of support for people to enable them to exercise their rights. And a lot of them are paper tiger rights in my view. I think I think that's something, isn't there, around... Um, so I did some... some uh, trans awareness training earlier this year with a group called Gendered Intelligence and they've talked about it's the first time I'd heard the idea of default that it being a default type a default group in society and they're the group that write the laws and they're the group that the laws apply to they're the group that um, hold on to the resources and they're the group that use the resources to their advantage and there is a real issue I think with not just that the legal support isn't available for people but, but when people do get access to legal aid that that though it's so such a tight um, small group of, of lawyers who are able to provide that, that they're run ragged off their feet and, and that they don't get the time to really sit and get to know the people who they're working with or be trauma informed in their approach mm. so that they can spend the time with people who have um, gone through some really like difficult and horrendous things and support them to access, access the justice that they do that may be available to them. But there is, but then I think there's also, there's a gap <clears throat> Um, in society, people who don't have any rights because they're not recognised as citizens. Um, and I think was one of the things I was going to ask you to speak to, if you don't mind, was was for people who who we don't who aren't just unseen, but who are also undocumented, who have horrendous stories and 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 who've had really terrible things happen and find themselves somewhere where they aren't even recognised as as citizens. Was that for David or was that for me? But for you, Roz, if you don't mind coming in on that. And I'm going not, to a, not a problem at all. So one of the examples I gave before we actually begun was this whole domestic abuse bill, which speaks, and it, it's wonderful that coercive control is now being recognised. However, it's only recognised if you were born in this country. If you have been trafficked or you are some form of sex slave brought in under the, the guise of being an au pair or a nanny, and you are then convicted, you're out the country at the other end of the legislation. How can that be right? How can it be right that you are in one of these positions where you have been trafficked and you have no rights to employment, you have no rights to state benefits? How does that help? Imagine that you are in a strange country because you've been held captive. So you may have an understanding of the language, but it's not necessarily nuanced. And what happens is you're put into a system that you don't understand, that is actually geared up to find you guilty because you're not getting therapy for the fact that you were traumatized being a trafficked person. 
you already have this negative stereotype that exists about who you are, what you are, and what you're actually representing, then you don't have access to wider justice because you don't have a choice of solicitor. You have no money, so one will be appointed to you. And no disrespect, David, and you know this uh, is coming from the heart. There are very good lawyers out there, but the very good ones tend to be overworked. And then as somebody working with trauma, because these people are traumatized, what you then find is the lawyer doesn't know how to deal with trauma. What happens when you're dealing with numbers of people consecutively who are here, I don't like the word illegally, but without papers, mm. and you are taking on board their trauma? The lawyer becomes traumatized. Where's the help and assistance for them? Yeah. Now you're actually in the system. The judge has no trauma awareness training. And trust me, the jury doesn't. And our juries, and I love the jury system, I'm a huge advocate of the jury system, but the juries don't have any training on what trauma is, nor on how these undocumented people got here and what they represent. Instead, we're subjected to the outside influences of a press that tells us how awful these illegal people are. So how are they going to get any type of justice when you've got breakfast jurisprudence from a judge who's not been trauma trained, good lawyers, and there's a few, you know, there's bad ones in there too, who have not had that stewardship, that understanding of trauma, and then a system that has totally ignored trauma because it was never, ever designed to deal with trauma. So there's one example of older people. Now, if you're a child going through that system, the immigration laws, and again, David can correct me, but whilst I was in practice, the immigration laws were such, they were changed under a conservative government that said, if you're 12, you're old enough to go and live by yourself, out. So how is any of that helping essentially people who are victims? So we've got a terrible system if you weren't actually born here. And it's not so good, even if you were born in this country, because it isn't designed for people who do not fit a very small profile of who justice is for. And I think, yeah, and, I, and I, the, there's a, um, it's not just, it's not just one system though, is it was, because it, it runs throughout a whole load of different, like our law doesn't just apply in the court, it applies across a whole range of different things where people are, may well believe that they're protected in some ways and then find that they're not. I'm going to come back to you, David, um, around, because I think there is something really important there around just the, the, the cycles of trauma that happen in justice systems and around, um, around how the fact that people may, may be coming in, as was described there, very traumatized, like acutely affected, affected by trauma, but then also the experience of the, of the amount of power that there is in the justice system has the capacity to traumatize anybody and I just I guess my question to you would be like what is there anything happening in the legal sector to try and catch some of this do, do solicitors or lawyers or people who are working in courts or does anybody get any training around around trauma or any support to deal with some of these difficult things um just even to, just so that the advocacy itself can be more more sensitive yeah I think I think, and Ros will probably confirm this, there's so many buzzwords, online courses, all that, all that type of stuff. But in reality, I don't think it's there at all. I don't think it's there at all. Are the courts slightly more gentle than they were when I was starting off 25 years ago? A little bit, a tad, but a long way to go. And I think Ros has hit the nail on the head. There's a lack of awareness as to how what people have gone through and how to support them and the problem is with lawyers and I say this as one myself is that a lot of the a lot of it it's a money-making business yeah and a lot of people think well there's not a lot of money to be made in this and we've lost that sense of civic responsibility and that civic duty and one of the interesting areas uh, that um, we've discussed at Vicky is that in relation to changes in relation to uh, the Mental Health Act I think there is a need for a national equivalent to the CPS. The CPS is obviously the state body that prosecutes. I think there should be a national organisation 
there for people with mental health issues. Staffed by, and this is another point, there are thousands of students coming out of university with law degrees, law conversion courses, and no jobs. There are no jobs. So you've got this wealth of highly trained, incredibly intelligent, some very, very committed to social justice people, and their talents being wasted. Yeah? You could have an organised body of specialised advocates that will be supporting people in terms of benefits, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, when they enter uh, the official administrative uh, system of the mental health uh, uh, institutions, when they're facing the issues that Ros has talked about in relation to trauma. And we train them. You know, it's funny, in the commercial world, when they're, when they're putting their lawyers through training, yes, they know the law, but they know about leadership skills, they know about marketing, they know about business development, they know about cross-questioning. All these are the skills that are added. We should be doing that for our mental health advocates. So they have that basic core of skills, not just as lawyers, knowing the law, black letter law, that's easy, but how the law should be applied, but also providing that support mechanism as well. Now, it may be the case that um, they still have recourse to call on people like Vicky or Rose or whoever it may be, but at the same time that they develop their skills. And I think until we really take that seriously, and I think there's an important debate to be had there at national level in support of specific services, then we're going to always fall short and, and we'll, we'll just see that we'll, we could have this conversation in 25 years time if we don't address it and if we don't have those changes. I think that's really relevant because I think one of the, one of the things around, um, around justice can be that you might have several different advocates and how difficult it is to have to tell your story to several different people who, are, who don't really know what to do with it. Absolutely. Um, or be, be moving between different departments and every time you move to another yeah. department, you've got a different advocate. Yeah. And there is something yeah. around constant, I mean, there's something that's just so fundamentally important, but just with having a basic kind of good relationship with somebody who's advocating for you, whether mm -hmm. that's a solicitor or mm -hmm. whether it's somebody who's, um, who's, who's doing like human rights advocacy as part of a movement mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I think there's something really important about the relational skills. So if we're gonna, you know, there is there is that risk of the corporate machine that takes people on and turns into a money making business. But when mm -hmm. I, I went, I, I managed to do a lot of a uh, year of law school before I um, went a bit mad and decided that those are the things that were more important than study. But not that there aren't other things, but you know what I mean. Um, and I remember being among a group of people who were really interested in social justice in that mm -hmm. at that age, going through university. There was a lot of passion about fairness and access to justice mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. And I would dare say that there's a good chunk of those now who are quite comfortably in corporate world, having mm -hmm. a very swish time of things and have forgotten mm -hmm. about those. And I think I think there's, there is something in um, students coming out of university who are passionate, who haven't been hit by the corporate bug yet, mm -hmm. and and given them given them a challenge around. Well, let's do something about this, guys, because you trained mm -hmm. him. Maybe you can. You in top. I, I don't know I, I, personally, and I'm going to put. Like, pop this back to to Roz when I think about the social justice ab, um, activism that happens in the community like we're not having a big impact on the on the actual legislation that's being drafted are we like that doesn't seem to be um we don't seem to be getting seeing the changes that we'd like to see in the paper letter of the law so what can we do from from a social so if I think of from myself as part of the psychiatric survivor movement and think about mental health human rights and the people who are or who who would like to see change, what 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 can we do? Where can we bear an influence over what people experience when they're accessing these kinds of things? Is there anything we can do? Well, I think we are having an influence. I think the fact that you can have this meeting today to talk about these things would not have happened 15, 20 years ago the way it's happening now. Although um pretty Prissy Patel's new paper doesn't have the rubber stamp or the proper stamp of survivors on it, that was a conversation about childhood sexual abuse that we would never have had. We are fighting a government, a society, ourselves, in terms of looking at <clears throat> equal rights for other people. We don't 
give children value. We don't give women value. If we did, do you think that most rape cases would fall by the wayside? Do you think there'd be a group of women taking the government to court, which is happening right now, to have judicial review of the fact that the government body made the decision that it would have a bet on cases that would turn out to be winners, as opposed to there is strong, solid evidence or evidence that ought to be considered. We wouldn't be in this push me, pull you situation that we've got now. So yes, there is change happening and it's people like you, Vicky, and you, David, by having these conversations and by pushing forward for the advocacy of people who would be marginalized by the system. But there's a huge political question. And um, for me, as somebody who is pushing for the victim survivors of childhood sexual abuse, which is never historical, by the way. I hate when people say, oh, well, you know, it happened yesterday, you live with it today. What needs to happen is we need to look at ourselves as individuals and ask ourselves why we elected a man like Boris Johnson who said we're spaffing money up the wall. We have to ask ourselves, what do we want from a society? And those of us who are here and have a passion for equality because we believe the life for life self is the value are the ones that are making the change. Don't hold out and wait for the government. We have got to keep pushing and raising our voices. And Vicky, you have in this forum and people like David, who is on the inside and is prepared to see change within the legal system. People like myself who don't like the legal system who feels it does not advocate for mental health, for vulnerable mental health. Mental health is a good thing, right? It's healthy. But sometimes there's an aberration because of trauma, because perhaps we have learning difficulties. Systems not designed for that. And when you look at the level at which people have been attacked under this political climate, who are disabled and who are women, we have to ask ourselves why the questions about who we are and what we are prepared to advocate as a wider society and the people we speak to. So yes, it's happening. The change is happening. We have to hold the faith, push harder, speak to the things that we believe, not just to a group like ourselves, but the groups who don't normally fit into what we say or believe. So that's the everyday people on the street. Change is happening, Vicky. We are going to win. Do you know what? Well, I, like, I do think you're right. And I, I almost want to ask for forgiveness for even asking it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> but there is like there is this kind of sense of when we're having conversations like this and we have a collective and we have like we can stand on the shoulders of giants in various movements and feel as though we're in a place with people who understand and get it and want to see change and then you tip up to an appointment one day and you're on your own and that's when the reality hits of how little power individuals have in the system and how easy it is for that power to be taken away because of our experiences or because of the way that we've been labeled by society. And I just wanna come back to you, David, and ask, is there a role for collective and, and a space for collective advocacy in the legal system? I'm, th I'm thinking around when people, like Rosa described there, around people grouping together and taking on challenges to the legal system. Like, is there, is, is there any way that people can access support to do things collectively now that you're aware of that's part of the system? I think um, I think they can do, um, but I, I agree with Rosa's point in that you've kind of, you've, you've got to live that every day because the, 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 the danger is that there are a lot of projects and, and schemes out there, but they're rather disjointed. And, and, and I think people lose energy too quickly and I think what, what needs to happen, in, in my view, in relation to just this idea of a, a CPS, a, you know, for, for covering sort of issues in relation to um, mental health issues, I think, I think you need something concrete. So you need to be able to go to the University of Teesside, just for example, I'll just pick that on Northumbria or whoever it may be, and say, this is the idea that we've got. We've got some really good people who are very enthusiastic, who will use this as a, an embryonic role model and we'll make mistakes we'll get it wrong and we'll bang our heads in despair but at the same time we will make some progress and i think i think that's what's got to be done and that's got to be voiced at quite a high level as well because then you generate success and success generates success and that's where ros is spot on 
if you look at our legal system, when I started out in the profession, um, if you were female, um, you had to work for about five years before you got the right to be unfairly dismissed. Yeah, if you were a part timer, it was seven years. Um, if you were if you were um, gay uh, or lesbian, then what you had to try and do is argue that's oh that's some type of sex discrimination. Uh, it's not about my orientation; it's sex discrimination. Or if you were transgender, you had no rights or protection at all. Now, now that's a very different scenario. And one of the fantastic cases, uh, just moving off a little bit, you know, just before Christmas, Taylor versus Jaguar Land Rover. Somebody who was gender fluid was successful in bringing a claim against Jaguar Land Rover for the horrible abuse they'd suffered. Fantastic, yeah. And it's having those little victories and those little points of call that are then then notified and taken out into the public arena because at the moment it's a bit I would say just looking back into history it's a little bit Victorian there's a lot of philanthropists out there there's lots of interest group and that's great but it lacks that national drive or regional drive to make it really sort of credible and focused and that's about people just coming together you're always going to have differences you're always going to have maybe on how procedures should take place or how you present but focusing on those common issues protecting vulnerable people that's our purpose and then meeting with certain organizations that assist that and pushing on so answering your question i don't think it's quite there yet i think you've it needs you've more, yeah it needs to be more coordinated uh, and and structured because otherwise i i don't think we'll get that punch that we need I was going to come in there if I yeah, met you. Vicky. Absolutely in agreement with you, David, which would be no surprise. But I think there's a particular role for white men to play. In this. I agree. And in terms of sexual violence, in yeah. particular, against women and children. And I say that because I cannot believe the hate and abuse that was thrown when they brought in the act for the legislation against upskirting. So this is when men took pictures of women yes, with their I skirts. Know. And it wasn't just women, it was young women. And what was mm -hmm. horrific about it is the first year that that law came in, over a thousand of the men who were prosecuted were actually paedophiles. They had paedophile images on their computers. And this is a wide thing. Now guys speak to guys. It's not yeah. okay if you're 13, she's 16. It really isn't. In fact, yeah. I don't, I'd raise the edge of consent, but it's another story. Yeah. But it's for white men to stand up and protect all women and all children. It's not okay to throw hate or sexualize women. And I know it's easy to do because we have a society that encourages it. Mm -hmm. David, I don't know if you are familiar with the case in August last year, when for having over a thousand sexual images, the Tory former campaign person was yes, up with yeah with yeah, fifteen was it fifteen months yeah. instead yeah. of a two year sentence? What yeah. kind of, how are we forcing no. change if he if the judge allows him to have yeah. images? These are hardcore sexual images of babies. Hmm. And the man gets off with community service. I we know. need men. We need white men to stand up because that's who the laws are for and say hell no. Absolutely. And I, I, I totally agree on that point, Rose, in that, you know, we should be there saying, I'm sorry, but as a citizen, and I'm proud to use that word, as a citizen of this country, I do not find that acceptable in any shape or form. I don't care where you went to school, whether you were at Eton, whether you were one of the so-called finest universities, who you know, or how much you earn, it's not acceptable. And you're right, there's got to be that unity across the board. There's got to be, and in many ways, Ros, it's there, but people need to get together more and be saying that quite openly. And that's why you're right. You know, having a forum like this, it's, it's an important starting point. And I do, I do think it's really important for us to be reminded of the fact that these horrible things are happening all the time. And I think we've got a bit of a situation going on nationally at the moment where we have an, an element of compassion fatigue by the amount of crap that we're being bombarded with in the media and distracting us from what's going on. And then we also have these intergenerational issues where, um, where power 
is it's still it's still hereditary in this country isn't it like power still passes down through families it's not we talk about like you know we we, we think we're bordering on socialism but it's only because we're more socialist than america we think that we have a meritocracy but it's only because it's more of a meritocracy than it was 50 years ago but in actual fact it's, there's still an awful lot of power in a very small amount of hands and as 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 citizens we have we are or as as, as members of movements or as as an international um because it's not just it's not just in the uk but as like an international collective we have a we have like this responsibility to to collectively think about how are we going to deal with these issues of of power and how are we going to deal with these hypocrisies and how are we going to deal with the fact that people who have who are from deprived backgrounds are being whether it's through prison or whether, whether it's in the criminal justice system or whether it's in the family law system and having their children taken away or whether it's from the mental health system and being diagnosed with mental, psychiatric disorders, which then end, allow you to be detained. Like we've, there's, there, there is a very definite um, issue with, with power and the, the majority of us haven't got an awful lot of it and that isn't being served by our justice system. So I'm just going to ask you Oz about um, collective um, collective adv advocacy, collect groups of people who are coming together to try and sort this out. Like locally in the Northeast, we've got some stuff um, that we've got some groups who are who are doing advocacy type work on behalf of collectives, but it's quite a, it's quite fractured and it's quite, you know, there's stuff happening here, there's stuff happening there. Like what what kind of things are there that people get could get involved in specifically around justice issues um, and and injustice that you're aware of in the work that you do and then I'll pop this over there to David. Is that for David or is that for me? For you now, Ross, Ross and then I'll, I'll ask the same question of David in a second. Okay. So the the big one I will start for for adult survivors of child sexual abuse is is survivors' voices. Survivors Voices and Little Row are two different organisations, but we are one in the sense that we have the same aims and objectives. And I work very, I'm an ambassador for Survivors Voices. And within Survivors Voices, we have an activism group where we encourage people to come together with their ideas so that we can all be part of each other's ideas and push them forward. There's also a thing called Black Lawyers. So there are Black lawyers who are fighting for justice for people who are from BIPOC communities. There are mental health lawyers down here in London, um, David would know about this, who are actually fighting for mental health reform and to help those people in court. There's also a human rights group and the name of the group has slipped my mind, but there are a group of lawyers that you can be involved with. There's Justice for Women who are not, a, are not all lawyers, but they have a number of barristers, solicitors who come on board to help them with cases that have seen some changes, like the Sally Channon case that happened a couple of years ago where she was released after being subjected to coercive control. There were lots and lots of advocacy groups, and I've just mentioned a handful of them. And of course, I would say jump on board with something like survivors voices and I'll tell you for why not just because I'm involved with it and littleroad.org but because trauma affects more people than you realize it's not just about poor people there are middle class people who are living a traumatized life they just don't even recognize it and that impact on their well-being and how they interpret the world and how they see the system there is room for everybody to become trauma aware in fact I think there are more of us that have been traumatized, not just through childhood sexual abuse, but neglect, poor parenting, parents probably didn't have the tools at the time, who come from middle backgrounds. In fact, the study that was done in America in 2016, or was it 2015, was actually done amongst 70% white middle-class people in America. And from that research, we know that 98% of them actually came out as traumatized and didn't even recognize it. So it isn't just people who will have less money. You can have, a re you can have less money and be really strong and robust internally. So every single one of us has a role to play when it comes to dealing with trauma, because this impacts on every single institute 
that doesn't help us. So there are so many groups out there. And um, if there's a way people want to connect with me, I can give them a group of things that are happening in London. It would be my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ros. I, I would love for you to share that information. Thank you. And I think I think that there is that. So I, I'm assuming you were talking about the adverse childhood experiences study in America, where they found that all the connections between childhood trauma and mental health, physical health, social, um, but but a lot of that happened with um, it, it started with students didn't it? and then brought, went out into into the middle classes and they did this big survey. But then also the, there's then been a second survey around the um, adverse social experiences that looks less on physical on the, the, the person and their their um, interpersonal relationships and experiences and more on the social context in which they were raised they found quite similar things and I think that that, that there's something really valid about the individualized nature of our culture and the fact that um, all of our experiences and ways our interpret the world if we don't fit get flipped back on us and then it, and that problem becomes internalized as a personal problem rather than it being a problem of circumstance that and a problem of our environment and that's one of the reasons why trauma-informed approaches and trauma awareness is is so very important across every system not just not just justice um and why it's so very important that we are able to consider ourselves as part of a collective and think about shared experiences it's why one of the reasons why P hope came to be in because really believe in in peer support and allowing people to connect over a wide range of experiences so people don't feel isolated and don't identify non um who don't identify social and um trauma related problems as internal issues with ourselves which david i'm just going to say isn't isn't the way the legal system <laughs> sees it <laughs> like so for a lot of for a lot of justice you've got to kind of go well and, and i guess kind of coming full circle where we start at the beginning like there's an identity issue there, isn't there? Because before you can get into the system, you have to identify that there's something wrong with you that needs to be that needs to be, and that and that's not something that's helpful for um, for survivors. There's nothing trauma informed about. Absolutely, about it's that. A, yeah, it's immediately saying, oh well, you you well in law you've got to prove things obviously, but it's putting those those it gets back to the starting point those high hurdles in place. Prove to me that you've suffered trauma sorry that evidence is not good enough i want further details of that so you go back to your client who is already traumatized you traumatize them again and then when the court says or the other side says we want more you've got to go back again you know it's absolutely ridiculous that it's 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 abusing the situation uh, a respondent's going to abuse the situation to cause even more damage to an individual it's scary going into tribunal. It's scary going into litigation. It's difficult because you you know you're you're in there in the witness box, and it just seems to add to the levels of the trauma. And, and just to reinforce Ross's point, if you look at stress, one of the most stressed group of people uh, in, in 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 the so-called professional classes, which are, which is uh, uh, you know given the fact that it's the care workers, the teachers. Who held our society together, the social care people, rather than the lawyers and the bankers, etc. But if you look at a, a, an area where there has been profound uh, trauma and bullying and harassment, it's the law. It's the law. It's partners who bully and harass a young trainee coming through, largely female, male as well. And if we look at the, the reports coming out of the Law Society, Something like 60% of trainees feel they've been bullied or harassed in the workplace. And I've got to be honest, when I, I trained down in London, it was difficult. You know, it was hard. And um, the problem is that we, we don't look at that broader context of trauma and, and where the problems are arising in our society, and it happens at all levels. Um, so Ross's point's great. I would say I think London's far more dynamic and organised and proactive We've got a lot of good workers up in the northeast. We've got some fantastic organisations, but I sometimes feel we need that that energy and that drive and that coordination that you see uh, in, in sort of a lot of the London groups to actually start making a voice and making an impact being heard. And I think that's a challenge for us, Vicky, to actually start learning from those models uh, uh, elsewhere in the country and seeing how we can be more effective in influencing policy decisions, obviously at national level, but at regional level as well. And I think that's key.
Uh, yeah, I think there is. There's a lot, isn't there? And um, there's, there's a, the around around the the collective kind of. I'm just I'm just thinking of how to how to describe that idea of it. Just it just it influences and bounces around within the system. Power trauma, power trauma. Whether you're an employee in the system or whether you're you're trying to access the system or whether you're being subject mm. to the system. This this. Um, wherever there's power, there's, there's there's the capacity for trauma, and wherever there's been trauma, there's a sensitivity to power, and, and for obvious reasons, because power dynamics are what caused trauma in the first place, particularly in the personal stuff. So there's this kind of like bouncing between, and one of the things that really I think um, would be would be a, a, a utopian environment would be that if we could just kind of like knock all this stuff on the head, really. Um, and share power and sh and and reduce the opportunity for trauma across the board. And and one of the things that I'm just I've just there's a there's a question in the chat that I wanted wanted to pick up on around um um so my understanding of the context between perpetrator um perpetrators and trauma survivors and let me just make sure that I've picked that up right Emma so just drop into the chat if I've if I've misunderstood but my my understanding largely around um, perpetrators who are also trauma survivors is in relation to intergenerational trauma and these loops of kind of learned behaviours. Um, and that, that that is a cycle that needs to be broken. There's, there's a question there about um, preventative interventions for perpetrators. And I do think it's relevant. And I do think that it's something that needs to be talk about, talked about in terms of like, is there a way of preventing per perpetration, basically? That, that, is there something that we know works? Is is there is there opportunities? And I, I shall I throw this to Ros? Do you want this one or are we? If we in, intervention into what? If we're talking about sexual abuse of women and children, and our boys, our boys get abused, and women are abusers. So let's not go away with this idea. It's a hundred percent men. It isn't. Women are abusers. Can we intervene as a society? Absolutely, we don't want to because we think it's okay. We need to readjust our thinking. So let me explain what I mean by that. Before we even get to the courts of the justice system, we have a feeling when we know something's not right in a neighbor's home or with a child on the street, we have a feeling. We sometimes see the way an adult treats a child. We don't intervene. It may not necessarily be sexual abuse. It could be emotional abuse. Trust me, it's bad. Being neglected is bad. And we see it. And what we hear is children who may also be going through their, their own trauma abusing children like that. Adults who will look the other way. There was that experiment a few years ago with a womany looking child left at the station unattended and everybody went past and they put a blonde little girl down there and everybody went, oh, what's happened to you, my darling? We need to wake up to who we are and how we value people in society. And perhaps that's because of how we value ourselves. So we know within our families, we have an inkling of feeling that something's not right. We need to stand up. We need a society that says, we need a government that says, the way children and women are treated needs to be looked at. And we know it can happen. Things have changed in the last hundred years. Pre-1975, a woman couldn't buy a house. Pre-1930s, children had no rights at all. It's better, it's not good, but it's better than it was. And that's because we've become more and more aware of a society. So we need to become more aware and we need to intervene. If the child's being beaten in public, Bringing the police in is a bit like dog law. It's already happened. So what we want to do is see somebody being awful to a child and recognize that's wrong, even in our families, and be prepared to stand up and speak. Here's the tough bit. You're speaking against society. You're speaking against daily images that show little girls dressed up as women. You're arguing against pageants where little girls are objectivized into mini women. You're looking at a society that only just managed to work out page three is kind of dirty and grubby. You're talking about a society where the chief of police, and I believe it was in Manchester, said he was horrified at the level of porn that he saw men downloading on their computers in 2019. So we have individually got to say this ain't right. 
We're talking about a society that had an 11 year old girl in 2016, a black child who was called a woman and they used the C word to describe this child, that she is a Yatsi in next Tuesday. We each have to stand up against those horrific voices, not in the wider society, but right here in our families, because 70% of childhood sexual abuse happens with people we know in the family, with the neighbors, with the person we call uncle. We have got to give children, and this is the change, we have to give children the power to say no. That's what needs to happen. Or rather, accept that they have the power to say no, because they're not willingly saying yes. And that's what we have to work on. So yes, we can have intervention. It doesn't have to be the police. It starts with us as an individual standing up and saying, don't treat my nephew like that. My niece doesn't want to hug you. That's okay. Even if you're her uncle, she doesn't want to hug you. That's fine. Yeah. When we start advocating that change, that intervention, it will filter up. Do not expect the government to do anything for us because change happens outside government, forcing them to change. You look at the great Renaissance, it wasn't because of the government, it was because of the artists and the people at the time. And that's what we need to be. We need to be, sorry Gandhi, but I'm boring him here. We need to be the change that we want to see happen. So intervene when you see that child being roughed up at the supermarket till, because I'm still horrified that I didn't. I actually saw that and I should have said something and I didn't intervene. You've got the right to because that child needs your voice because it's not fully empowered. Yeah, intervene like, with the family too. Sorry, Vicky, okay. you were going to say it's like get over that social awkwardness. But that's what it is most of the time that holds us back is social awkwardness and that sense of, well, what? What's going to happen? And our fear when there's something actually happening to somebody else at the time, like, you know, that fear of it has that fear of the unknown versus the actual that's happening in front of you. I think that's that, that, that social awkwardness needs to needs to give way at that point. And, and one of the things that we're really, really keen on in Peter Hope is trying to, to, to facilitate communities that feel empowered to do that together as well, so that it doesn't feel like an individual, an individual action, but it feels like the community that you're, you're part of expects that and um, supports you in that. And part of that as well, coming back to, to David, because um, one of the things that we're really keen on doing in Peer Hub is trying to find some way of supporting people to access advocacy. So I really do think that advocacy is important because even in those situations where it seems really cut and dry, the system intervenes and all of a sudden it's really messy and you need someone to help you negotiate. So one of the things that we want to do is build, um, build support people to understand their, their rights, support people to understand what is available that's outside of justice systems that can help. And then if people end up in justice systems, whether it's because of the Mental Health Act, because we're a user-led, peer-led peer organization around mental health, whether it's to do with the Mental Health Act or something else, that people have access to advocates. Um, advocates that they know, advocates that are part of our community and advocates that know our story and our likelihood to have had trauma histories, to have ways of surviving trauma that are unusual. Um, so, well, basically what I thought you is, David, you talk about this idea of CPS, um, of a CPS. What about community organisations? And what about, what about groups that aren't part of the system who might want to do something about this? Is there anything that we can do? Yeah, I think I think Rosa's point is excellent, mind you, in that societal change only comes about through individual actions. And you see that in terms of any area of, um, of, of, of cultural change. But particularly in the law, look back at the cases that have been taken about people are being brave enough who have said, yeah, I'm gay, what's your problem? I'm going to bring a claim about this. And I, I don't care about, you know, if the, if the public vilify me or what have you, I'm going to make a stand. The transgender uh, employee that wanted to make a stand. It's all those small individual choices and they have a much bigger resonance than you actually think. Because as soon as that decision came out on transgender rights, we had a number of organisations contacting us saying, what's this all about? Uh, what, what, uh, what, what can we do? Because they don't, they see it maybe in terms of two ways. Number one, that they want to support people in the workplace. But secondly, 
I don't want to be pranged for £180,000 and have my name all over the Northern Echo or whatever it may be. So it makes people listen and forces change, which is imperative. In terms of uh, voluntary groups, etc., my view is that the more training we can give or organisations can give to advocates, um, the better, basically. And I think we all should be an advocate. You don't need a plummy accent, an Oxbridge education, an Eton education, uh, or a lovely pinstripe suit to be a good advocate. All you need to do is have integrity and to be able to question. Yeah, and those skills can be easily trained. It's not it's not that difficult and people shouldn't be frightened of it. And I think the more advocates that we have on a, a mini level, as it were, the more you can support cultural change. And then that's supported and cemented, and I think this is important, by something bigger, whether it's regional or national, that's by the by. But I certainly think at regional level, it's key in the northeast that you start pushing that agenda and start liaising with the universities, liaising with the legal advice centres and building something, even if it's small, even if it's small, then then people can tap into those resources as well. So it's a two way process. Number one, your small individual advocacy training and number two, something a little bit more macro. So there's a credibility there and also um, uh, you know, a, a pooling of good, good practice, as it were, so people know what's good and what's worth uh, a adhering to. But I think sooner rather than later. Yeah, and I th and I and I, later. and I do think that there is this thing of like these. We learn through stories, and these stories need need to be told and need to heard and need to get out. Mm. And the more that we can give space, whether that whether we think of advocacy as being creating spaces to for people to speak up and be heard or whether we think of the formal advocacy roles mm -hmm. of like we are going to advocate on your behalf in a yeah. system like advocacy is really important and those collective stories and i'm all about you know once you see so like we're just about turning the hour and we've just mentioned stories and that's us here at eight o'clock guys but no mm -hmm. seriously though um there is a there is a a, a, a mention in there about in the chat there from jane about um or oh, is this it was I am an independent mental health advocate. I'm not sure what the next one is, but lots of acronyms around advocacy stuff because there's lots of different advocacy roles. You're absolutely right to highlight that, Jane. And the, the I'm not entirely sure, to be honest, about to what degree that people get different kinds of training or what the different roles are and how they fit in. But I, I do very much like the idea of that unless you're in a situation where something's really complicated, that an advocate can just advocate across, like you said, David, said David it's about creating a platform for people mm -hmm. and giving them the opportunity to have their their say and to, to say what mm -hmm. happened and to be heard and believed, isn't it? So that's kind of what advocacy should be. So I don't know what the answer is to Jane other than to like give them all one acronym and tell them they've got to share their jobs out. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I'm afraid that we've come to the end of the hour and I'm just like, I've really kind of, I always find these, um, these kinds of conversations where we're talking about um, power and then trauma and then collectiveness and then individual and personal and social like I always find them a little bit uncomfortable that kind of balance of kind of hopefulness for the future but then also the reality of of the moment and what we're, and what people are having to deal with today so I just want to say a really big thank you to Roz and David for coming and spending their Wednesday evening right in the middle of the week um, talking to us about you know justice this really complicated subject in an hour and you know trauma survival mental health like I don't think I could have made it more complicated if I tried but thank you so much for making it so very interesting and engaging and for really bringing out some of the issues especially was I was going to give you the like the kudos there for just diving straight into it at the beginning and and opening that conversation from the outset I'm really grateful for that um and um, we've got one more webinar in our launch series tomorrow morning on subjective analysis. And then um, and then we have to actually do some work, <laughs> which, you know, we're really quite excited to do. But I'm really, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, and um, hopefully we'll see you around. And if you're interested in what we're doing, I'm just going to drop our, um, our website in the chat. Ros, if you want to drop your... Any links in the chat there for people you're more than welcome to. David, if you want to drop your any links in the chat before people leave, um, you're more than welcome to. We'll be putting the 
webinar onto YouTube and any important links, we'll make sure that we've spoken to Roz and David and collected links to put up with the webinar so that if people are interested in stuff that we don't have time to, they don't have time to hang around and pick links up from there from the chat there then we'll, we'll put them on the on the webinar details on youtube anyway so that's us <laughs> thank you thank you ever so much for coming